So we're in the original control, control tower. This would have housed flying control where all operations of this airfield in relation to the aircraft were conducted. So right from the mission go, we would establish that who was flying on the day. Some 20, 21 aircraft would assemble for that mission around the perimeter track. The perimeter track being about four miles on this 600 acre site, housing four squadrons. Each squadron would field X amount of aircraft, depending on availability. So this aircraft would then taxi, depending on the wind, east, west, to take off down the main runway, which is 6,200 feet. So that's a mile and some change. And this 30 ton bomber would need all of that runway to get off the floor. In conditions in the UK, which weren't so favorable a lot of the time, mist, fog, which isn't great for aircraft lift. So they would assemble around the perimeter track and from the control tower, with communications from the air traffic control tower, he would then fire a, a flare to say, it's a mission go, it's a mission scrub. This would be very weather dependent again. And this also depended on the weather over Europe. If that was socked in over Europe, then they would call it a no go and they would stand down. Eventually they would be given uh, a flare to say, yeah, we're going. And within 30 second intervals, these big aircraft are lumbering into the sky on their next mission. And they would disappear for hours. They would then sweat the mission out here, as they called it, where the ground crews would go to chow uh, and everybody would go about a normal day on this base. They would eat, um, they would uh, take in a movie, do amenities, whatever was going on in this drone would come in the sky and all the eyes would look up and start counting in these aircraft. Some of them with engines out, some of them smoking. And of course the air traffic controller then comes into a, a different period where he's looking to see if any of these aircraft would need a priority slot. aircraft a priority slot and the appropriate dispatch of emergency services to the aircraft. It may be an occasion sometimes where uh, it's a wheels up landing so they would certainly advise and certainly the pilots would be briefed on this that don't land on the main runway and the reasons for that are obvious. If he blocks the main runway because it catches fire then we've got other problems trying to land the aircraft uh, that are already in pattern with them. So you would land on the grass and hopefully everything would go well. And this is really dependent on him getting rid of his bomb load. Um, so uh, it'd carry eight, 500 bomb to the target and with different fuses, um, thermal fuses, um, uh, fuses that are uh, armed when the, the bomb is dropped by a little propeller on the front. They had thermal fuses, which I've said they had time delay but there would be an occasion where a, a bomb would get hung up, so the crew would do their very best to try and get rid of this. They don't really want to land with this, but sometimes there, are, you know, there is no option, and they would land very, very carefully. And a lot of the time, it weren't without hiccup, but also some of them didn't, and there would be a big bomb. Uh, go off and lots of fire and lots of people running around.
is all happening. Base life goes on on this 600 acre site. Three to three and a half thousand personnel going about their duties, uh, performing all sorts of tasks on pay, um, admin, um, fuel, mechanics. This was a whole base life. This was a whole world in a 600 acre site servicing just one bomb group. And as we know, around the airfields of Norfolk, Suffolk, Cams and Beds, there were many. First, second, third air division, putting a lot of the time a thousand aircraft plus fighter, fighter cover into the air to go to Europe to disable the war machine in terms of aero engines, um, ball bearing plants, uh, and latterly the targets were changed to uh, oil refineries um, to stop the Germans' ability to make fuel. If they didn't have fuel, they couldn't fly. So this is what happened. Uh, and this went on for 18 months uh, and 306 missions later for the 100th bomb group and over 700 killed and missing and a further 900 plus prisoner of war. The cost in human life was nothing short of catastrophic. Certainly during the early dark times of 1943 onwards through a three month period the 100th bomb group had a 400% turnover in crew and it gained this moniker, the bloody 100th.